students have great stories to share would rather share them verbally than in writing, and many enjoy listening to stories even more than they enjoy reading them. So in November 2015, Annals decided to experiment with the Story Slam format as a new vehicle for physicians to share their stories. The first Annals Story Slam was held in the evening at a public radio event space next door to ACP's Philadelphia headquarters with funding from the Macy Foundation. With over 500 attendees enjoying stories from a dozen storytellers, the event was an enormous success. Videos of those stories, as well as those selected from similar events that Annals has hosted over the years, are published on the journal's website, annals.org, where they have been viewed by many thousands of people. Today, we have the treat of listening to our colleagues share their own stories. Videos of the stories you hear today will be candidates for publication in Annals. Without further delay, let the storytelling begin. I remember clearly the day that I was sitting in Grand Rounds. The speaker for the day was giving an update on a virus in China that she thought was unlikely to give us much trouble. I remember the morning in the ICU when suddenly I could not enter the rooms of patients with upper respiratory symptoms because they were persons under investigation and their COVID-19 tests would take at least a week to result. I remember when masks in all clinical settings became mandatory and suddenly I realized how much my patients relied on lip reading when talking with me. I remember the phone call from my mother telling me that my grandfather had caught COVID-19 and suddenly all the patients I had seen die from this disease suddenly flooded into my consciousness. It has been a heck of a year for memories and I would be lying to you if I told you that the majority were good ones. I have witnessed the depths of human pain and sorrow with the frequency that I never dreamed possible. Patients dying alone in glass rooms, family members crying on the phone as you tell them their loved one is getting worse. Physicians and nurses whose faces are etched with lines of disbelief and despair. Yet amidst this background of pain and darkness, moments of bright hope have shined through. A patient we were all certain would succumb to COVID-19 rallied and prevailed. An attending who went out of her way to bring a patient trapped in isolation the Starbucks coffee he was craving. And a love story that spanned two hospitals. Larry is a pretty stoic guy. When he caught COVID-19, he didn't want to be admitted because he felt there were others who were more deserving of his bed. He was further conflicted by this prospect of hospital admission because his sweetheart Dorothy was being admitted to a different hospital across town. Larry and Dorothy both became quite ill from their disease. Larry became delirious and so weak he had difficulty getting up the gumption to eat, leading to a feeding tube being placed to support his nutrition. Dorothy had ever worsening respiratory failure, necessitating higher and higher levels of oxygen. Their children would contact them each day and try to keep them looped in on how the other was doing, but we all could tell how much they missed each other. As Larry became weaker and the days protracted, he became more depressed. Talking about his Dorothy really was the only thing that would brighten his eyes. One day, we all decided it had been too long since Dorothy and Larry had seen each other, and so I set about trying to get them connected via video chat. As I'm sure you can surmise, I do not exaggerate when I tell you it took us nearly all day to get the video call set up. But finally, with delays that seem all too characteristic of this last year, I was able to gown up and bring a tablet to Larry so he could see his best girl. Dorothy had her high flow oxygen cannula on her face, but beamed in a way that could only be described as pure love when she saw Larry on the screen. Larry was not strong enough to hold the tablet himself, so I acted as tablet holder extraordinaire while they reconnected. It was one of the honors of my lifetime to get to witness their love for each other. The call ended up being pretty short. Neither one really had the strength for a long conversation. But the next day, Larry started eating again. He started sitting up in bed and working with physical therapy. Within a week, he was well enough to get to rehab. When he left, I lost my updates on Dorothy, but at our last check-in, she was holding her own. I hope they have come home to each other. Most of the time, it feels like there's very little we can do when a patient gets COVID-19. We give them oxygen, steroids, antivirals, immune modulators, and none of it seems to do much good. 
we hope and pray and work and research and try and in the end it often feels like we are standing on a battlefield of a war we have no chance of winning. The isolation, pain and death linger and permeate every facet of our lives. The memory of suffering become overwhelming. But sometimes we are able to bring a lonely man coffee. Sometimes we are able to give the family the news that their loved one will be coming home. Sometimes we stand witness to the love of a lifetime. So no, the majority of my memories from this last year are not good ones, but the good ones shine bright enough to hold me through day to day, month to month, until this war is won. I'd like to leave you with a poem I wrote about my experience this year. Each line is a quote from patients who were dying or from their family members. I'm not afraid of death, but I do not want my family to suffer. What's more important is who you leave behind. She spoke English, he spoke Spanish. They had me to translate. I keep praying to let me take his place. I just can't close that door on him. He's my number one forever. Thank you. From category five hurricanes to pandemics, my medical school journey has worded quite a lot, but I'm here. <laughs> My name is Zavian Kalu and I'm a fourth year medical student at the American University of Antigua College of Medicine. From beating Miami traffic to the hospital to beating the line at the grocery store for toilet paper and wipes. On that Monday, I walked into the Peds clinic ready to conquer. As I got to the attendant's office, she handed me an N95 and a colleague said to me, did you get the email? <laughs> what email I said? And there it began, the change in my training. Hospital rotations had been postponed effective immediately until further notice. What? Like we were just two weeks into peds with four to go. I had a surgery rotation coming up. How was I gonna learn about surgery online? Like I did not understand. Then the Zoom era began. I had online rotations for about 16 weeks or more from completing peds to psych to almost all of surgery. Yeah, surgery was virtual too. <laughs> Talk about Zoom fatigue. But I was blessed with great teachers who understood the times and put in the effort to make sure we got most of the season. My last core rotation was going to be internal medicine. Was I going to have that online too? Um, as a fourth-year medical student, along with the lights at the end of the tunnel, comes your decision table. What specialty am I considering? What do I see myself doing? Etc. And at this point, I didn't even know what field I wanted to go into. And with COVID came a new question on the table. How do I learn some of the skills needed for my training? Would I even be ready? Um, then the breakthrough email came to resume. Yes. The first week I resumed, most rounds were in post-COVID patients who were either recovering, had complications, or were fully recovered. It was different from the common presentations, you know. And the part that got me was doing ICU rotations on, doing ICU rounds rather, on patient A on Monday. And doing rounds on Wednesday, they had passed. Like, almost every week was like this. It was sad. Some patients fought and won. Others didn't make it through. But the way my IM attendant handled or interacted with the patient's families and the patients themselves, I wanted to communicate better. And her diligence was inspiring. I became interested in internal medicine. You know, COVID-19 pandemic, with its unprecedented times, unexpected sequelae of events, overwhelming spread, times of uncertainty and unfamiliarity, it really taught me the things we take for granted, the impact of the news, living in fear of the unknown, communication and reconnection with others, self-reflection, to prepare for the unexpected, preparation meets opportunity, attitude, mindset, work habit. I wanted to come out of this pandemic stronger. I wanted to look back and say, who did you become along the way, despite all of this? You know, I learned from John Maxwell, change in perspective, challenges, Humor, adjustment, newness, growth, evaluation, change, come have a new growth experience. It all started out as Vision 2020, but what I didn't know was that my sight was going to change. Sight is a function of your eyes. Vision is a function of what you see with your eyes closed. Now, what I envisioned was completing my rotations in person, but what I saw was a new way of life in March 2020, the spring break that never ended. Every NFL player comes into the game with the mindset to win. The first couple of minutes seem slow until one team scores. There's fire on the mountain, the pressure, the expectations swell up, their energy starts to go down, etc. Everyone starts the year in with the mindset that it's going to be great. 
they make plans, they put in the work, the hours, etc. The first couple of weeks seem okay until the heat gets turned on, something at work, family, friend, or just something random, and boom, they might get off track for a bit or just get tired. The second half of the game is usually harder. Teams put their best foot forward. They take the rusty players off the field. Coaches don't bench their best players. I mean, that's what makes or breaks the game. That's when people sit at the edges of their seat trying to see who will be standing at the end of the day. The throws, the passes, the free kicks, you name it, become so relevant. Players remember their blood and sweat during practice and realize one thing, they gotta win. Coaches scream and cringe. The audience anticipates. But at the end of the second half, there's only one team standing. There's just one winner. When this pandemic becomes a thing of the past, hopefully, are you going to be standing? That's one question that I have. And that's one thing that I wanted to think about. I wanted to be standing. I wanted to be that physician who, despite it all, got through, overcame, was able to be encouraged and be an encouragement to others. And that is my story. Again, my name is Vivian Kalu. Thank you. My name is Naaman Apadia, and I am a second year medicine resident. The COVID-19 pandemic defined the second half of my intern year. At the beginning of the year, we were taught that this year we'll be learning how to become physicians. This entailed learning how to recognize when a patient was sick, learning how to escalate care, and also learning the important scale of talking to patients and family members um, under difficult situations, a skill that we briefly discussed as medical students with standardized patients. This education in particular was accelerated um, when the pandemic hit the hospital, and especially when I was on night float. You know, every intern dreads the first time that they have to do night float. It's a common rite of passage. It tests our ability to triage, our ability to handle emergency situations. And for us, it was a team of three, each of us maybe handling 80 to 90 patients. And our job was to shepherd these patients to the morning um, and also to respond to any emergency situations or rapid responses in the hospital. And my first time on night float um, as an intern was about a month and a half into the pandemic. And not before long, many of the signouts started having noted that more than half of the patients were COVID positive. And when we're first oriented to night float, we're taught to go into every situation together as a team, because you're more likely to solve that problem with multiple brains rather than one. And as the nights went on, we noticed that the number of rapid responses was steadily starting to rise. And there was a night that felt like a marathon. You hear it overhead, you see it on your phones, rapid response. And the adrenaline starts to build, your heart starts to race as you're walking towards that room, and you have no idea what you're about to enter into. And, you know, you hear 72-year-old male, COVID positive, hypoxic, full code. And you do what you need to do, chest x-ray, oxygen, update the family. But before we're even able to lift a finger, we hear another rapid response. We run there, we break off. And while one person deals with one situation, us as a group deal with another. And before we're even able to finish that, we hear another 68 year old female, COVID positive, hypoxic. And all of a sudden they're alone. And this continued to happen um, through the night. It felt like one very, very long emergency and was emotionally and physically draining. And before we knew it, the wolf pack had dissolved and we were handling these cases on our own and not because we felt comfortable, but more so out of necessity. And we're trained as physicians to gather pieces of a puzzle to put it together so that we can treat the patient um, by seeing the whole picture. Except in this case, there was 
no, there were no guidelines, there was no protocol to follow, and we felt that several pieces of the puzzle were missing. And after seeing several cases through the week, we knew how to escalate and we knew how to help, but it was every time when talking to that patient, seeing the fear in their eyes, talking with their loved ones on the phone, that there was no preparing for. And if there was one critical thing that I took away from this experience, it was that one of the missing puzzle pieces, in my opinion, was the time and care that it took to properly discuss that patient's situation and care with them. Seeing their fear in their eyes, but not letting them see the fear in your eyes. It was being the eyes and the ears of the family members to relay their heart to their loved ones. More importantly, it was learning how to describe the unknown. And that's one thing that I'll carry from this night flow experience from the pandemic in my practice, and I hope to become better at it. Um, but definitely one thing I will remember as part of the pandemic. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Lexi Frankel and I'm a third year medical student at Nova Southeastern University's Dr. Koran C. Patel College of Allopathic Medicine. And today, I'm happy to be sharing my story with you, one that I titled, Unpredictable. The threat to my four-year plan initially arrived in an email. As a result of COVID-19, classes will resume online and in-person clinical activities are suspended. I thought, how will I get the experience I need if I can't learn in clinics or research in a lab? After a virtual encounter with a standardized patient one evening, I laid down and rested my laptop over my abdomen to study. I had been experiencing some intermittent abdominal pain and constipation for a few months, but I chalked it up to the stress of medical school. But as my laptop tilted to the right and I fought to adjust it back to level, my eyes panned downward to meet my plan's next enemy. On my abdomen's left side, I noticed a slight elevation, as if someone had placed a golf ball deep below my skin. In the doctor's office the following morning, I felt this creeping suspicion that the pit in my stomach was more than nerves. This would be a shorter story if the IBS diagnosis I received that day was correct, but my intensifying pain led me to see a gastroenterologist, who then sent me for a pelvic ultrasound. The doctor then urgently called me back to his office to discuss the results. He read the report, each word reminding me of the buzzwords I had learned while studying ovarian cancers. And then he read one terrifying sentence. Follow-up is needed to exclude malignancy. Do I have cancer? How will I study for my exams? What if I get COVID? Another two ultrasounds and an MRI later, I sat in my gynecologist's office as he explained. The test to rule out cancer, the CA-125, would also be positive in the other disease you could have, endometriosis. This meant that I'd only have my diagnosis after surgery. The excision of my ovarian masses was scheduled for the day after my final exam. It seemed like whoever was in charge of making sure my plans went smoothly got a little confused. I said I wanted to be in person to do procedures, not to get them. But hey, maybe I would get some clinical experience after all. Alone, as CDC guidelines restricted guests, I stepped into the hospital on surgery day, wondering if my future diagnosis would allow me a future in the very halls I stood in. I awoke after the procedure to the surgeon's gentle words. I'm very sorry, but it appears that you have extensive endometriosis. Not cancer, it's over. But after celebrating the seemingly good news, I started to wonder if I put on my party hat too soon. I didn't have cancer, but I had a stage four chronic disease, growths on multiple organs, and would need further surgeries. Navigating my treatment was complicated by the pandemic. 
My hormonal treatment injections were in short supply because of COVID travel restrictions, delaying treatment and risking regrowth of previously excised lesions. Endometriotic growths on the tissue near my heart and lungs increased my own risk of COVID complications. In class, I double masked and obsessively sanitized, no longer focused on just the health of my patients, but also of my own. Chronic disease in the midst of this pandemic has changed my perspective of healthcare and the way that I will practice medicine. I now understand that the shock of a diagnosis, whether it's from a novel pathogen like COVID or from a chronic illness, can change plans and the way that people view themselves. Am I now less of a woman because I face infertility? Will others think that I'm weak? I began this year with hopes for preceptorships, volunteering, and clinical activities. Now, a year later, I am minus a few clinical experiences, plus a few surgical scars, and minus a couple of organs here and there. But as my plans derailed this year, I began to see the beauty in the detour. My class wasn't learning in person anymore, but we quickly discovered our adaptability learned how to treat patients and conduct research via an online platform. Lessons that we never could have learned if this pandemic didn't happen. Similarly, I struggled and still struggle with how endometriosis will affect my health. But with this diagnosis, I have discovered my strength. I've learned that success is not determined by how strictly I or society follows plans and achieves goals. Instead, it's about adapting to plans gone awry and accepting that real life cannot be perfectly planned. Thank you, everyone. As I sat awaiting my COVID-19 vaccine just a few short months ago, I remember thinking how exciting and strange it was to be back in a clinical setting for my first year of medical school. My mind wandered back to March and the last few days at the nursing home where I worked and I couldn't stop the memories from creeping back of the rationed PPE, the families begging to see their loved ones. Tears burned my cheeks and I couldn't help but feel that I had failed my previous patients and the guilt loomed over me like a storm cloud. During the COVID-19 pandemic, skilled nursing facilities were the center of the storm. The more we learned about our invisible enemy and what it was capable of, the more the infrastructure cracked and unearthed disparities that could no longer be ignored. Last year, I was the dementia care coordinator in the memory care unit at one of these skilled nursing facilities. During any other time, we struggled with high employee turnover, burnout, limited resources and the likes, but we were always able to pull together to provide the best care for our patients. As February 2020 progressed and talk of the imminent threat began to bubble up in the news, employees still remained positive with utterances of, that won't happen to us. It's fine. It's under control. But it certainly was not, and we were not alone. Quickly, supplies dwindled, employees left in droves, and the panic rose, but we couldn't let our patients see our fear. Cries from staff and administrators alike for oversight, guidance, regulations remained unanswered because no one knew what we were up against, nor was anyone prepared for what was going to sweep through our halls. We were sitting ducks and we knew it, but we had to keep our spirits high especially for our memory care residents, trying to keep them safe. Once our unit went on lockdown, patients herded into their rooms like cattle. The decline was immediate. Without visits, structure, and routine, our patients, my patients suffered. Not understanding what was going on, they begged for us to free them, to let them go from the prison we held them in. There was no reassurance we could give them to provide comfort. Many wished they were dead. Others slipped further into their confusion, becoming more distant, and even more were lost too soon. 
Is this what was best for them, for their health, their well-being? The world is a lot different now than it was in March, and it feels like a lifetime has passed. We are much better off as a whole to fight against this enemy and have a lot to take away from it. For me, as I move forward in my medical education, I have learned the importance of having a plan for anything that life might throw at you, but to be able to adapt in a moment's notice, as I saw in my most resilient peers. Most importantly, we must not forget. We must acknowledge and address what this pandemic has unearthed. Resources to elder care and skilled nursing facilities came far too late for our nation to protect our most vulnerable, and we lost almost 250,000 lives of those age 65 and older. We must take this lesson to move forward, to do better and be better for our patients, parents, grandparents, and everyone we love. Men sano in corpore sana. A sound mind in a sound body. Hi guys, I'm Christopher Valentin. I'm a medical graduate from the Philippines and I'm currently residing here in San Francisco, California. I'm currently preparing for my USMLE steps and hopefully I'm gonna apply for the coming match. COVID-19 has really brought us so many struggles but also realizations in life. During the July of 2020, I was able to train for a month in Las Vegas in an outpatient facility. It was my first U.S. clinical experience, and it's really a great one. I got to see and examine patients and collaborate with my mentor with regards to the management of the patients. But there is this one old patient that I really remembered because apparently he is my first encounter with COVID. I was the one who examined him, but of course, you know, observing the safety precautions like wearing gloves and uh, PPE. He was exhibiting signs and symptoms of pneumonia. And as a precaution, I ordered uh, COVID testing in one of his labs, which turned out to be positive. I was also tested after, and I turned out to be negative. That experience was kind of awesome because I saw firsthand what is an image of COVID-19 patient. It was also during October until December that I also trained in an inpatient hospital institution in Houston, Texas under the mentorship of an internist. Every day I get to see his patients all around the hospital and my favorite are the ones in the ICU. I get to wear this uh, full gear PPE in order to join my preceptor in managing and seeing the patients, I got to learn how to monitor them and to look for pertinent signs and symptoms. I was really happy because I was given a chance by my preceptor to actively manage these patients, you know, by ordering the labs, medications. But of course, they're still of uh, his approval. I think those experiences gave me so much valuable knowledge and wisdom that I'll surely bring to my practice soon. I also got to show my skills as a magician to the patients, which really lightened them up. It was my own way of alleviating the pain and struggle with their diseases. Right now, as I'm preparing for my exams and application, I believe knowledge is important. But the most essential thing in the art and practice of medicine is really compassion. Genuine care always stems from sympathy, respect, and giving the patient a sense of hope. With my knowledge in medicine and skills as a magician, I believe I'll be a good doctor someday. I got something for you. Got a Rubik's Cube right here. Okay. You know what they say, there's a world record like uh, less than 5 seconds who completed this thing, like solved this thing. Okay, I'm gonna s solve this right now. World record. Watch, one twist, 
Still mix up, right? Watch. Always stay safe. And I love you, everybody. Peace. Starting residency in the middle of a pandemic was an unbelievable experience. Starting residency is scary enough, but to be starting this at a time in our lives that's so unprecedented, it's really hard to articulate, actually. When we think about pandemics, you know, I just think about what I've learned in the history books, what we learned in school. You know, we learned about the plague the same way we learned about Greek mythology. It's really detached. We don't have that much personal experience. It's the same way that a little kid thinks about dinosaurs and dragons and can maybe get them confused. You know, one is real and one is not, but their own personal experience with them is about the same. Starting in the hospital as a new physician during all of this, there was just no way to prepare for that. You know, med school teaches us so much. You know, we get tools about how to take a good HPI and how to do a good physical exam. But there are no tools for something like this. There's no toolbox. You have to learn as you go. I still remember, you know, one of the first patients that I admitted on a general medicine floor, she was being admitted for COVID and her mom was in the ICU for COVID, and her brother had just passed in the ED that day from COVID-19. And I remember looking down at the date of birth, and she was my age. She was 26. And it really, you know, it makes you think about your own mortality, to think that someone your own age could be here dealing with all this. And there is no toolbox for how to do that. You know, it was so scary to go down and admit this patient you know, just, you know, how do you ask someone about their social history and their family history when their entire family is laying beside them in hospital beds? It's been an unbelievably scary time. You know, as a resident and even as a med student, you look up to your attendings as mentors. You know, we see them as all-knowing beings and to have all of these people we look up to so greatly and to see that they're at a loss too. No one knows how to deal with this. There is absolutely no toolbox. And to see all of these people you really respect and admire at a loss and to be this scared, that's probably the one thing I really was not prepared for, this level of institutional helplessness that you just can't really shake, that no one quite knows where to go from here. In the last year, we've made amazing advances and this country has done an incredible job of banding together. And we have moved so far. The way that the vaccine movement has gone has been incredible, but it's still just been very scary. But I guess the one thing I've learned this year is that while there is deep sadness around us, there's also great courage. I've seen it in the faces of my mentors, my co-residents around me, the nurses that we work with side by side, none of them really have ever experienced this before. No one has, but they continue to push forward because that is what we do. That is what brought us to this field of medicine, this curiosity for science and to move forward even in the space of great tragedy. And especially I think what has motivated me is the this courage that I've seen from my patients. I remember that patient ended up having to go to the ICU herself. And the day we were able to take her out of the ICU was one of my favorite days of intern year. We were able to send her home with her mom and that was an unbelievable feeling. I really think, I thought that I knew what empathy was as a medical student and beginning residency. I thought I had a good grasp of what that means having done all the volunteering that we did and, and rotating through my you know, hospital rotations in med school, but to see such strength in the face of so much heartache, I think that that word took on a new meaning for me. 
and to see the courage from my patients who had lost so much to be able to walk out those hospital doors and continue living their lives in a world that is still very scary. I've seen so much courage from my mentors, from the people around me and from my patients. And while this year has been extremely scary, I will remember every patient and every, every death that I have had to see, it is etched in me and will be something I take with me as I move forward in my career and in my life. I'm very grateful for everything that I've seen this year and I cannot imagine having been surrounded by better people. Hey guys, my name is Enrita Mahesh. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at the University of New Mexico. And this is my COVID story. I'm doing this for everyone who is unable to step up during COVID like they may have wanted to for whatever reason it may have been. To tell you a little bit about myself, I was diagnosed with lupus at the age of 13. This was complicated by lupus nephritis, which required a kidney transplant by the age of 21. My donor was actually a friend of mine that I had met only a few months prior who ended up passing away on a motorcycle accident. Flash forward to March 2020. I just started wards as a second year and four days in I get pulled off. COVID had hit me much. Being immunocompromised and not knowing much about COVID at the time, my program thought it was in my best interest to do a little home learning until they had a better idea of what the plan was going forward. While this was amazing the first few days, I slowly started to feel very guilty and very useless. Um, these feelings were definitely not new to me. Um, back when I made the decision to go into medicine, I had a very surprisingly mixed response. Some people were very excited for me um, and some people had questioned well, what about you? What about your health? What about the health of this kidney that someone had generously given you? And um, since then, I kind of just held on to this guilt as a resident. And here I am, kind of on the opposite end of things, having this guilt about not being able to be a resident. Um, so, it, and, and to top it off, I ended up getting admitted uh, three weeks later for pyelonephritis. So I was just adding burden onto burden. My program had to call in backup for me for wards, and now I was another patient on their panel they needed to see, and I was unable to help. Um, despite my desire, despite, despite my knowledge, despite my skills, I wasn't able to help. So my doctor, who was one of my attendings, um, I had a long discussion with her about how I was feeling and she had sat down and looked at me and said, no one could have predicted this would have happened. And you should not feel guilty about wanting to help yourself or wanting to help others. While this is something I had known, um, it felt so good to hear from an attendee. Flash forward again uh, to about August 2020. I was back on wards, I was excited. I wasn't seeing any active COVID patients at the time, but I was getting a lot of post-COVID NICU transfers um, who were traked, pegged, um, weren't able to walk after being bedridden for the past three months. I was able to get them weaned off the trach, eating again, I'm walking again and it felt so good. For me, um, I had found my role in all of this madness. This was a good reminder for me that despite whatever limitations I may have had, that there was a role for me where I could still take care of my patient, take care of my gift, and also take care of my health without feeling guilty. And I think this is a good reminder for everyone that you should never feel bad about wanting to take care of yourself. Thank you for listening. Hello, 
I'm Neha Panchaknala, a second year internal medicine resident. I was walking down the hallways yesterday and was stopped by a man. It did not take me long to recognize who he was. He was my patient's spouse. I took care of her a month ago and our team treated her for COVID-19. We were able to wean her off the ventilator to get a tracheostomy and a feeding tube, help her set a foot on a long road to recover. She was one of a few successes. I was curious as to why he was here. They admitted her to the inpatient rehab uh, where I was working then. I walked with him to go see her and I heard a voice as I entered the room. At first, I thought it was inside my head, but there she was. She was speaking through her voice box. Tears rolled down her cheeks as she reached out to hold my hand and said, Thank you for taking care of me. It took me back to 40 days ago when I was sitting next to her on her bed, decked in PPE, as she was telling me she was getting tired with the mask, but scared to get the breathing tube down her throat. I remember the fear she was trying to hide inside her eyes when she called her husband to tell him she loved him and that she was going to rest in God's lap till she got better. I prayed too. As a resident, I frequently have difficult conversations with my patients' loved ones about the severity of their illness and explain that we will be walking on thin ice for the next few days. Those days when I have more than few of these conversations, I start to worry about my own family and make sure to tell them I love them. I entered the pandemic's war grounds with my shield and armor on, ready to save the world. Although it took a while for the virus to make its way to West Texas, it kept coming back. I was eager to learn, curious to see if patients would respond, if the proposed treatments worked. However, it wasn't exciting anymore after the few weeks. Members of the same family were being admitted to beds next to each other, and many of them were dying. My own family scattered across the globe, understandably, was very concerned for my own safety. Though I tried my best to keep them at ease, I was much less at ease thinking of what my patients' family members were going through. I would even seek success stories from my colleagues to hear that they were discharging COVID patients home and that piece of news offered me solace and helped me to go to bed at night. I remember my father was asking me in the beginning of the pandemic what to do if we get it and I distinctly remember telling him well if we prevented it it would be fine. However it was not long before he got the virus he was really sick and far away from him I would treat patients of my father's age like I was treating him thinking of him every minute. Confused emotions, aren't they? Well, he was continuing to worsen. My trained physician brain was putting the facts in front of me, but the daughter inside me wanted the sticking clock countdown to be nothing but a bad nightmare. Making medical decisions for him as a self-employed proxy, without getting drawn into the cauldron of emotions, I was actually shattered inside and was walking on those shards. Not long after, the source of my existence, my father, who tended to me and motivated me to become a healer, became a mere statistic that the rampage that the pandemic has dealt us. Living seven seas away, I was not able to travel. Like everything else, I had to pay my respect virtually. I was surprised that the sun rose the next day. The world was supposed to freeze. The truth though, I had to return to work four days later. Back to taking care of those who suffered just like my father. Now what do I tell their families? While I explain plans of care, all that I could hear inside my head was that there's no coming out of this. I started to question whether I should actually work. Then I reminded myself why I was this far away from him. In the first place, training to becoming a full-fledged physician, he supporting me in my decision so that I could make a difference in people's lives. Well, while I speak, this, I realize this grief is endless. We as physicians witness death every day. Growing up in medicine, I thought we'll get used to it. But thank God we never do. Death in dealing with it is always an emotional roller coaster. I made up my mind, regardless of the outcomes, that I would help families navigate these grim situations. I decided to celebrate every nano unit of progress my patients made, and I did it. I repeatedly find myself repurposing this leftover grief into motivation to work even harder in caring for my patients and their loved ones. Today, I walk out of the hospital rejoicing that two of my patients are weaning off of their oxygen requirements, and one of them, after being on the ventilator for 40 days, is able to get ready to go to rehab. And victories like these help me gather the scrapings and find my few silver linings. I continue to remember what he taught me growing up, that a doctor at duty is nothing less than a soldier at war. I am new. Unfamiliar pattern of sidewalks into a hospital, square maze of numbered rooms. Senior doctors correcting presented plans to make me worthy of the recently added letters behind my name. 
You arrive to round. Neatly printed notes, press white coat, and listen to me babble. Elderly woman, diagnosed dementia, admitted again, altered mental status, failure to thrive. You meticulously direct the plan, treat the high sodium and urine infection, stop medicines with sedation in their scroll of side effects. She greets us with a frown, turns her head away to show two lines of neat braids, yells for us to go away when we inch forward. You recognize this pattern of progression, prescribe home with hospice, but think she will keep coming back again and again. You teach, this is what happens when families don't listen, can't accept. I am simple. My fourth week in the intensive care unit, the tonal ring announcing code blues, ritual of death pronouncements are now routine. Two patients separated by a wall, sharing that thin strip of land before death. Their lungs scarred from COVID into stretched plastic bags. You question. Change their ventilator settings, diaries, feed all you want. But what is the point? Why keep them hovering at the edges of the in-between space when you know they will die? This is not medicine. This is not humane. I still grasp for numbers and details like they are air. Laser on the daily minute changes like a dog chewing an empty bone. You tell me to back off, let go, and I come back to find her red lipstick and coiled hair faded and limpid. Her last lucid moments on this earth filled with her family panicking, yelling into beach while she resigns, nods, and closes her eyes. You look weary, skin lined by waves a carver etched onto ivory. I decide to spare you my what-if questions, let you think we did everything possible, when I wonder what might have happened if we had not already given up. I am inexperienced. When I hear Kakexic, I see his frame stretched out, his body a list of failed organs, his chart a column of red exclamations showing me how his biology is incompatible with life, only his heart untouched by AIDS and lymphoma. I recommend comfort, family agrees. You request compassionate extubation. I ask for help. Yet in the moment, I am the sole physician racking my overstuffed and empty brain. How much pain medication to give? His furrowed brows tell me, not enough. When his body finally releases his soul, the shell is a figure from Goya's black paintings. And I wonder, what part of this was compassionate as I tried to close his half-peaking eyelids for the last time. I am trying. For the elderly woman with her curled braids now fraying, the high sodium, urine infection, medication stopped to make no difference. My fingers trace the telephone cord loops day after day, listening to her daughter's distrustful, frustrated alto. You Bring her in, sit down, watch videos of her mom blowing birthday candles. You reinvestigate, send a few more tests. One comes back positive, unlikely, but possible. Enough to try treatment, ultimately fails. Now I talk about home with hospice, and she says, yes, you tried all you could for my mom. That is all I asked for. The telephone blurs before my eyes and we laugh about crossing paths in another life. I hang up one quiet moment before returning to the hospital ebb and flow. One day, I will be seasoned like you, knowledgeable like you, grown up like you, a true doctor like you. May I always be new enough to learn Simple enough to recognize what is common, naive enough to believe there is always a better.
May you show me the diligence to walk two moons, the fire to fight for what is important to another, the steadfastness to steer my patience to that line of light where the sky skims the sea. And when I count my rosaries, may it never be penance for a failure to imagine. Hello, my name is Zal Fayo. I'm a third year medical student at the Johns Hopkins University of Medicine. Uh, the story I wanted to share today is titled Hidden Smiles and Hidden Opportunities, Medical Education in the Era of COVID-19. When COVID-19 suddenly upended our lives in March 2020, I was a naive second year medical student, enjoying what was then my last spring break before starting clinical rotations. Many of my classmates were traveling, some returning home, some hiking in national parks, others backpacking across Europe. It's a last hurrah of sorts before advancing to the next milestone in our medical education. At first, the changes appear temporary, measures taken in an abundance of precaution to flatten the curve. Our first clinical rotation was postponed to June. That's an extended spring break, I thought. Then the changes came seemingly all at once in rapid succession. Cases spiked all over the country, special COVID units were designated, and clinical rotations were now indefinitely postponed. With no end to COVID-19 in sight, I coped with the uncertainty the same way many of my classmates did, by binge watching trendy Netflix shows, trying my hand at homemade bread, and obsessively checking the latest COVID-19 statistics. However, the concerns lingered, namely, how will our clinical training be impacted moving forward. After my seven month hiatus from clinical experiences, I began my first rotation in October in obstetrics and gynecology, but with new rules for medical students. We were to interact with all patients wearing masks and face shields and refrain from seeing COVID-19 positive or suspected patients. Even then, I could hardly conceal my excitement at the thought of learning medicine at the patient's bedside. During my time on the obstetrics floor, I was immediately struck by the challenges patients undergo during their nine month long journey in the midst of a global pandemic. One of my first patients, Mrs. S in particular had a lasting impact on me. She first presented to triage with intense contractions of increasing frequency. I nervously introduced myself as the new medical student on the team and elicited her story. Mrs. S indulged my questions with generous details and showed no distress, although her occasional winces tells me otherwise. In this chaotic environment, she displayed a matter of fact attitude and a sense of calm about her. After all, she was a labor and delivery nurse herself and was expecting to deliver her third child. Sensing my nervousness, she even primed me to emphasize certain aspects of her story in my presentation so I could impress my team. The following day, I got to know Mrs. S on a more personal level. She confided in me that the most challenging aspect of her pregnancy had been the loneliness. From the first detectable heartbeat to learning the sex of her child, Mrs. S experienced the quintessential milestones of pregnancy alone. During her pregnancy, she only left her home for prenatal appointments. Her husband, sidelined by COVID restrictions, could only join her in his parked car through FaceTime. She reflected on distinct memories throughout her journey, especially regarding her baby shower fully conducted through Zoom, complete with a slight deck of compiled ultrasound images and concluding with the chosen baby name, Bryce. Mrs. S was a natural teacher and shared clinical pearls at every opportunity. A few hours before going into active labor, she was demonstrating the Leopold maneuvers on herself. During the delivery, I held her hand and found myself nervously joining in on her breathing exercises. I helped deliver the placenta, carefully maintaining a gentle traction on the umbilical cord, just as she previously instructed me. In the midst of providers moving about after a successful delivery, my resident handed me an iPad on the screen was a gallery view, view of Zoom filled with family and friends of Mrs. S eagerly awaiting to see baby Bryce for the very first time. I excitedly panned between Bryce, Mrs. S, and the providers, our joyous smiles hidden behind our masks. Upon reflection, I realized how privileged I was to be in that room with Mrs. S. 
a woman I had met just a day ago, while her loved ones who have known her for a lifetime were relegated to their screens. Her resilience in the face of loneliness was a shining example of how patients were stepping up to the unprecedented challenges thrust upon our daily lives by COVID-19. I had the distinct privilege of caring for other women who oftentimes alone and vulnerable presented their lives and the lives of their unborn children to a team of providers whose, whose faces they will never fully see. Despite the COVID restrictions, I was reassured that medical students will continue to have enriching clinical experiences as long as patients like Mrs. S existed. And they do. Thank you. Hard to be so nice when I would rather be polemic. It's been difficult in medicine surviving this pandemic. Through all the stressors, whether big or small, try to smile and stay positive and miss it all. Sometimes you find your breaking point. I found mine. Got a positivity hangover. Smile through the pain and now it hurts from a positivity hangover. Gave so much, I'm out of reserves. I got a flat. At least it's sunny. Feeling stupid, it's kind of funny. This was golden and patient's dying. I'm on the phone, his wife is crying. Just gotta keep it all together cause the sun just made the weather. Whatever challenges are on our way. They say do yoga or something else. Spend time doing things for your mental wellness. Yeah, sure that helps. But got a positivity hangover. Ain't so simple to find a cure from a positivity hangover. Gave so much, I'm out of reserve. Walking down the halls to get lunch in the hospital and pass a body bag as I'm on my way. Got a lot of problems and I just can't always solve them and it's hard to keep my chin up the same. Got to smile away. 